Hi, Jennifer. Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. We're so thrilled to have you today. Great to be here, Nikki. Well, let's dive right in. Uh, I am so blown away by your story and your career journey. And uh, there's so much for us to learn from everything you've accomplished. And I'm excited for our audience worldwide to get some actionable strategies from you. But let's start at the very beginning. Uh, tell us a, some of the highlights of your life and career, and particularly what's the through line that connects it all? Well, I think, you know, um, like a lot of people, I was impacted by my own family, but my mom was divorced when I was five. And what was interesting about that is that she had three young kids. I was the oldest. She had a one-year-old, a four-year-old, and a five-year-old. She had no formal education. And so she had to work two full-time jobs as a waitress to make ends meet. And I can still, Nikki, remember those times where you know, she'd come home at three o'clock in the afternoon and do the change into her next uniform and we'd figure out dinner together and she'd be gone until very eight, very late. And, um, you know, there were times where she really struggled to, to pay the bills. Um, my, my young brother, you know, climbing into her wallet and taking those quarters and, and that was the money she used to pay those bills. And I had this epiphany at the age of 12 years old. I was riding my navy blue Schwinn bike home from school in the middle of the street. And I literally just sort of had this vision looking, you know, up into the sky. And that was, you know, I had a sense, number one, that I wanted to have some large impact. I sort of the second thing was that I figured it was, um, well, the second thing was that I wanted my own financial independence. I didn't want to rely and go through what my mom went through. And the last thing, which ended up being a big lesson, was that I figured that it was going to be all up to me to, to, to make it happen. And I think that really stemmed from, you know, not seeing anybody there for my mom and not really having anybody around. And so I ended up for a very long time operating as if no one was going to be there for me. Hmm. That is uh, such a powerful founding experience. Um, how has that shaped your career choices as a result? I mean, how did that help you then gain clarity to say, based on this experience and the things that are important to you, how did that then lead you to make the career choices that you did at the early years? Well, I think one is that I really sought out um, and through my career, you know, took some risks and made some change because I felt like, you know, the way, and this, this is something that I talked to folks about, you know, sometimes the way to move up is to move out, unfortunately, mm. but not always the right thing, by the way, but we, we can come back to that. But I, you know, had some very, very wonderful career experiences at a very young age that, you know, I, I would say, first off, look at my mom, you know, seeing my mom struggle financially had a huge uh, impact on me. And so mm -hmm. I decided I wanted my own financial security. But I also at some point thought that, you know, TV was my route to uh, impacting people on a large scale and, and ended up doing TV. And that led one thing to another um, and, and partly to what I do today. But I think along the way, also wanting to pay it back because mm -hmm. after working very hard <laughs> in extra, and you know what that's like, but really a lot of work and being a little bit of a workaholic uh, or a lot of a workaholic. Now I'm really focused and, and grateful for where I'm at, but focused on how can I leverage my strengths to do what I'm meant to do in this world? You know, I think we mm -hmm. all have strengths and we're all meant to do something. And a lot of times it's easy to really fight that, you know, God, why didn't I get that job this yeah. time? You know, and I can look back and it's, you know, we can drill down into some of these lessons, but now I'm, I'm really at a place that I feel so enormously grateful to be doing, mm -hmm. to have, you know, been focused on my money at a very young age. You know, when I was putting myself through college, I found it fun to be doing like budget spreadsheets and where my money was going. I sort of, I literally got off on that. Um, so that's sort of a high level of, you know, yeah. what we down today, today. And, um, you know, having been in some really incredible roles where a lot of times we don't think about the opportunity to learn when we're in a role, mm -hmm. but I've worked some, with some really incredible people in my career. And I think that's one of the takeaways, whether you work with somebody 
who happens to be very well known, like Jamie Dimon or mm -hmm. the state treasurer of California, um, some other people, or just great people around you. There's so much to be taken away in every role that can then prepare you better to be a leader in whatever you do next. Absolutely. You know, it's uh, interesting, something you shared in your response was um, how you were able to not only create the financial independence, but also do something you love and create impact. And this is an area that we hear from so many women that we work with and also hear from our audience about this dilemma of, do I pursue money? Or do I pursue something I love? Uh, or do I do a job that is paying the bills and I'm just waiting for that Friday? Thank God it's Friday because I'm so miserable. I'm waiting for the weekends. Um, how did you reconcile that? Or what advice would you give to someone who's torn about that, but is coming from a place of uh, really needing to support their family and their needs? Um, we know that when there's lack of resources, you pursuing something that you're passionate about or want to create impact feels like a luxury because there's more pressing needs. Well, I'm a believer in don't uh, take a leap until you know what you're leaping to, because it is a mm. lot harder to find a job or if you happen to be starting a business um, when you're out of whatever is you were in, you're in a much stronger place. You're in a place of strength if you're going from one thing to another. But I think, you know, I was just uh, giving a keynote speech recently, just last week, actually, to a lot of women and talking about this. And I, I think that it's human nature, maybe it's partly being in America that, you know, and all the focus on money and people starting businesses and, and you know, making gazillion dollars. First off, that is the rare story, okay? That <laughs> yeah. is not the common thread. And it's easy to feel like the grass is greener on the other side. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, as you know, starting a business is incredibly difficult. Talk yeah. about not fun. There are a lot of not fun moments. It is incredibly mm -hmm. difficult, right? Yeah. And we know all the challenges and barriers, particularly for women and, and people of color, you know, horrendous. And so, but I do feel a little bit that the, finally, the wind is more in our backs. There's a lot of positive mm -hmm. things for the first time in 30 years, having been in the women's space and in Silicon Valley in the early boom days, you know, watching what's happening. I think finally, there's some huge opportunities opening, opening up for people who were always generally shut out. Um, so anyway, so I would say if you're if you're looking to make a change, first off, really know why you're looking to make a change. I'm a believer mm -hmm. in writing it down, um, spreadsheets. Like you know, I advise people if you're looking for a job or something. I mean, really, like what specifically are your priorities? Um, you know, is it more money? Is it a different lifestyle? Is it a different working environment? Um, and then. I would also examine if you can get that in your current role. Again, mm -hmm. it's so easy. I think it's the common, you know, the common mantra to go look elsewhere. And, you know, I did a book a long time ago called The Millionaire Zone. And one of the key uh, takeaways is to really look at what's in front of you, what's right around mm -hmm. an immediate circle and your current work environment. Let's say you are working for somebody, you know, there's usually a lot of opportunity. If you are somebody who willing to raise your hand, be proactive, think creatively, problem solve, mm -hmm. everybody's looking for that, you know? And I think that can often be a better path to moving up. Um, and, and, and we also sometimes think, oh gosh, I gotta be at the very top or have a certain title to be a leader. A, a young woman actually asked me at this event, you know, we're, how do we get to the top? We're like, we're ready to lead, you know? Well, you can be very influential and you can be a leader by who you influence and the, the extent of your influence. In other words, you can be in an organization and, you know, you might not have the certain title, but 
you could be a chief of staff or a deputy to somebody or just very close to somebody making things happen mm -hmm. and have enormous influence and you're still a leader. And I think those kinds of roles can definitely prepare you to take whatever the next move is. But I would always be ready and be super clear um, and always think about the what if. What if your plan doesn't pan out? What is my mm. back plan? Financial I love that. Wise. I what love is that? That is, that is really powerful advice because uh, it's so easy to fall in love with the idea of something that you don't have and imagine it to be so much better than where you're at, only to find out that you didn't weigh the downside. You only looked at the upside. Uh, and someone uh, once told me that if you don't solve the challenges that are uniquely you, you're only going to take yourself in the next environment and repeat that pattern. And uh, you, you are. Know, it's And you have to really, you know, you and I were talking, I think it's the mature person that is really um, able to look at their own kind of flaws, uh, mm -hmm. misbehaviors. And by the way, I have had to do it big time in my career, you know, really mm -hmm. stop. And I really have to work on certain things. And so, you know, sometimes I see people who are very quick to react to something when it mm -hmm. could just be the culture, the environment, um, you know, uh, maybe someone's just used or hasn't been in a real certain kind of work environment, right? Um, but I do think there's so many opportunities within or, in an organization that if you think creatively and build alliances or um, even just, you know, a little example. I remember, in fact, a long time ago when I worked for, um, I had sold this company. I started in Silicon Valley and I, I got hired at um, Bank One, which is now J.P. Morgan mm -hmm. Chase. Little, it's a great story, actually. I sent a cold letter to several top bank CEOs, I was thinking about what is you my- You sent it to the bank CEOs. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yes. And I knew that this company I had started, you know, we got a lot of media attention and, you know, I, and I knew some of these folks had heard about us a little bit. So anyways, I sent a few cold, I think it was, I can't remember if it was a mailed letter or email you know, saying, I'm thinking about my next gig and I think it could add value there. And one of them was Jamie Dimon. And I got a meeting there and meeting with him actually and ended up getting hired there. And, you know, I remember, um, you know, one of the executives kind of seeing just the level of follow through that I was willing to do, right? Being right there, mm -hmm. clearly impressing him, you know? And mm -hmm. so even just, that kind of thing can open new doors if you want to try something else or move into a different role mm -hmm. or, or um, you know, maybe there's a, a problem. Um, I remember actually in that situation, we were very much serving, the bank was very much serving the Latino market and the credit card side of the business, the uh, small banking side and the consumer retail side, but nobody was thinking holistically about this. And I saw that as an opportunity to you know, get to know folks, add some value in an, in an important area and ended up doing that. And so that's a good example of just thinking, um, you know, you don't have to hear about a problem. You might hear about a need just, mm -hmm. right. And you can maybe raise your hand and, and do it um, or um, identify something that can, yeah. you can take on and, and build your career. That's a phenomenal example of really taking initiative and uh, taking action with courage. Uh, but what often gets in the way of someone taking that kind of action, like writing to the CEO of a major bank or uh, raising a hand to be the one to solve a complex problem is this fear of rejection or fear of failure. Um, what has helped you step into those um, moments with courage and with confidence to follow through? Well, I get rejected all the time. I <laughs> tell people, you know, look at life, you will get rejected. A salesperson gets rejected like 90% of the time or something like that. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's part, it doesn't feel good. And, and, um, you know, most of the time it's not personal. I think you have to know that I don't think you have to, you do not have to check all the boxes to take on some role or something. And so that's a misnomer. You do have to have some basic fundamental skills. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, it could be bringing people together if you're doing that with other people and, and guiding them around, you know, what are the challenges and how might we solve them? Um, you know, communicating clearly and effectively, um, you know, running a good meeting, knowing how to run a meeting, but you, you know, all of this is learnable. It's learnable mm -hmm. by you know, I think what I did, look at, I didn't, I didn't come from this. I knew nothing about going to colleges. Zippo, I was looking at these other people, like how did they get there? Right. So it's mm. everything from dressing the part that you want um, to seeing how people communicate and a lot of practice, you know, it, mm. I think that's the other thing too, is you know, I'm such a believer in whether it's a meeting with somebody or, you know, maybe you're taking on a project is no prep yourself before you step into mm. something. You know, we all do that for, for this, right? Um, know what you want to accomplish out of something, have a structure or a, you know, a plan uh, for, I'm just assuming, if, let's say it's a meeting or a gathering. And, um, you know, you can also always bounce things off of people, right? Mm. I mean, I think sometimes we feel like we're by ourselves, but whether it's somebody at work or an outside advisor, you know, hey, I am thinking of broaching this idea with X, Y, and Z at work. Here's what I'm thinking. You know, does this come across right? I mean, you can do that, but if you never take the leap, you won't move forward. I mean, it's really mm -hmm. simple. It's like, what's the worst that can happen? Someone says, you know, uh, no, maybe the no is, you know, there's too many other things, priorities going on. And that's a valid reason. And you have to mm -hmm. be, a, you know, mature enough to say, yeah, you know, okay, I get that. Or um, maybe potentially you're not quite the right person, but, you know, it shows people something when you're willing to raise your hand. And maybe mm -hmm. you're not going to get the nod for that thing, but they might come back for something else, right? You're, you're going to stand out, I think, regardless. Yeah. And through every rejection, you often get closer to success because you learn so much through that, you know, through every rejection and through the feedback you get through that is that often it's almost like the pathway to success. Um, and so much of what you have done from, you know, one career choice to the next has continued to pave the way. Um, I want to dig a little bit into your experience as an entrepreneur, um, you know, as a uh, you know, we've both experienced enough careers. It's one of the hardest choices to make. Uh, I always think, gosh, this it's so much easier to make money in other ways than as an entrepreneur, but there's absolutely no su substitute for the growth and self-awareness uh, that you gain as an entrepreneur. Uh, what are some of the most powerful lessons you have learned that you would want to share with um, young women in particular that are uh, exploring that path, whether as an entrepreneur or as bringing that entrepreneurial mindset into their professional careers? Yeah, I, it's a great question. I mean, you know, going back to my earlier story of um, growing up and thinking I had to go it alone, that's probably one of the biggest mistakes that I made is I really went it alone for a long mm. part of it. I mean, I, you know, when I started somebody, my first company, Women's Financial Network, I did bring somebody into it, but I had this mindset. And part of it is that I just wasn't trained and educated in, um, you know, which is partly the value of sports even, but just in more like teamwork kind of things, okay? Mm. And I would go, I would come up with an idea and I would, start to execute it. And so in looking at how people are successful, while in the media very often looks like, oh, it was just Oprah, it was just Bill Gates. It was not just Oprah or Bill Gates. Okay. Oprah yeah. had Gail and Bill Gates had, um, was it Steve? Who am I thinking of? Oh, uh, Paul Allen, Paul Allen. Yeah. Just as a couple examples, right? Um, and those partnerships matter and the people that you hire or surround yourself with are everything you know mm -hmm. when i was in silicon valley it was kind of the gold rush days it was the very early days and you know we were very quick to hire people and i remember you know making some mistakes and it was running too fast and not doing you know it, unless you know these people i think you know a lot of companies a lot of people 
you know, use the network of their employees to hire people because at least mm. they know something about them. But um, it really matters who you hire and it's important that you know who you're hiring. And that means doing mm -hmm. reference checks and, and all that sort of thing. I think one of the trends that I've seen a lot with companies is they are now really having people work as contractors to get to know them, mm -hmm. as you know, um, before mm -hmm. really hiring them uh, on as an employee. So don't not going alone is a big one. I think, um, you know, it's also easy to dive in as I did and, and spend your own money and time doing things. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you put a good plan together, and this is what I did with Women's Financial Network, and you go to the right kind of backers or supporters, and you have a team, you got to have, you know, at least somebody else with you. Um, you know, you don't have to take the risk of all your own money. Um, and you can also do things, as you know, just, you know, mock-ups of what you're doing or um, certain kind of surveys that might show the demand or interest for something before you go full speed ahead. Really important. And we talk about that in, in our Girls with Impact mm -hmm. Business Academy, which is focused on um, young women, 14 to 24. Um, so I think those are a couple, you know, big lessons that come to mind. Um, I think one of the other things that I did do well is when I started Women's Financial Network, it was a company, and this lesson really can take in so many different areas, but it was a company that was dealing with, well, we, we didn't hold people's money. We were talking about money, which is a very, mm -hmm. you know, very big issue, right? You can't be a fly-by-night sort of company. Mm -hmm. And I also knew that to build the brand, I wanted it to sound substantial and safe mm -hmm. and secure and all that. So the name I came up with was Women's Financial Network. And what I still like about it, and I had people react to me, was that, you know, it was a really, it was a really good name. It was strong. It kind of said what it is. It sounded like it'd been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think it really helped us get a lot of um, traction in what we do. Mm -hmm. Not always the case. The world is very much changed today in terms of naming yeah. things, but that kind of credibility, you know, what do you want your entity to be in the marketplace and how are you going to set yourself apart from what else is out there? That's wonderful. Uh, so it's really about credibility, collaboration, and hopefully having the right kind of backers and uh, co-founders and team uh, that can help you make progress towards the mission that you're on. Absolutely. You know, and there's so many I think this next generation is, they've got in some ways many more skills than we all had when we were younger. Yeah. I think you and I were, you and I were, um, you know, in the early days of internet and technology and all that, um, well, to some extent, but, you know, this generation has so many skills. We, we hire them, we train mm -hmm. them and, you know, the digital acumen and the speed at which they, um, the, and, and the nimbleness, mm -hmm. right. Being able to move and, and move through things very quickly. And they're very sharp. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they are starting businesses at a very young age. But I do think back to something you said is there's a lot to be learned when you fail. And some investors look for that because they know mm -hmm. if you failed, you've learned a lot. It's a lot mm -hmm. easier to, you know, go along and think you've done everything just perfectly. Yeah. And, you know, there is some luck that yeah. happens or timing you know, yeah. um, so so I do think there's a lot to be learned again from failing, you know, whether it's on a personal level, professional level, mm -hmm. and stopping to think like, what really can you take away from this and and taking mm -hmm. time to 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 look at your inner self too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, there's something so profound that changes within you when you experience failure. Uh, especially when that failure is also coupled with a level of uh, public visibility or humiliation that you feel, right? It's it's uh, it's sort of out there and exposes. Not only do you learn the lessons of failing, but along the way, you also develop this stomach and resilience for doing the hard things. And you prove to yourself, I'm actually capable of surviving that and overcoming that and moving on. And yes. that That's is- a big uh, like it really I makes like you unstoppable. Now, yeah, it's. I think that that's the fear that holds people back is, you know, the what if. I mean, and I get it, particularly if you have a family. But when you go through things and look at everybody goes through something or other, 
the mm-hmm. more you do that, the more you do feel like you can, you know, I'm going to get through this. I think you also yeah. have, to, if you, you have a partner in your life, you have to have a partner who thinks that way too. Like my husband and I, we go, you know, we don't need a lot of money to live. Like we really mm-hmm. don't. We would be, if, if we lost everything, if we were whatever, we'll be, we're fine. Right. We don't have, yeah. we don't have to be living in some certain situation to, to be happy at all. Um, yeah. And I think that's so important to be grounded and to, mm-hmm. you know, to be happy as a couple too. I think, I mean, there's mm-hmm. so much for us to, to, to unpack here. Um, I was going to say something else, but now I lost my train of thought, but anyways. Yeah, no, but your point about um, when, when you're grounded in your values and what's really important uh, it's a lot easier to navigate through the uncertainties and the setbacks because it gets you back to what really matters. And uh, uh, it sounds like we're both very fortunate and happy and grounding relationships uh, that have helped us take on big risks, even at the risk of high failure. Right? You, know, you know, Nikki, one of the um, big areas where I've spent a lot of time is is talking to folks about their money and finances over the years. And the, the, the story that I think is just so compelling here is a very dear friends of ours, um, couple who's mm, late 40s, and he worked in the financial industry. And like a lot of people in the financial industry, he lost his job, but he and he took him two years to get back in two years they completely survived. How did they survive? Because, and they didn't come from a bunch of money because he sucked it away like crazy. And the wife said, you know, I used to think like, why does he not want to do anything? Life is happening now. Why don't I, why don't we live now? But you know, they had a home and they had a couple yeah. of young kids. And that is why, because when you, when you have set yourself up and you understand what you need or what you can survive and, and be happy, and you're not living beyond your means. He he was two years. That's a long time to go, you mm-hmm. know, without without any kind of paycheck. Um, his wife ended up starting a business, and I think that's the other two is where couples are. You know, I think it's for women. I think it's really important to keep your hand in the game. I just think for all sorts of reasons. But mm-hmm. being ready for that, what if if you are staying at home? What if something does happen to my partner or vice versa? You know, what's our action plan? And talking about mm-hmm. that is so important. I'm curious about something given your experience in uh, helping women in their financial lives and, and decisions. What is the most common fear or concern that, that comes up that holds women back from financial freedom uh, or doing what's necessary? Um, well, one is they definitely don't save as much as men. Okay. They just Mm -hmm. don't save as much. And if they do, they tend to be, uh, more risk averse. I think that's changed to some extent, but having their money, maybe in pure cash. Um, I think the other thing that really holds a lot of people's, I I remember this woman saying, you know, I know I have a 401k, but I just can't get to it. It's inertia. I just think mm. look at, from your health to your finances, you have to make it a priority. And what I do is, you know, I'm a list maker. Um, I will, you know, if I have to deal with something in a month or I check my finances, definitely once a year where I really drill down at the end of the year, I look at my financial picture. Where am I? Have I grown it by saving mm-hmm. and or seeing my savings grow? gives me just enormous pleasure. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's such power in getting your own paycheck. I, I I love that. I love the power of, you know, making financial decisions. I think it's powerful. And I think if mm-hmm. women see that, you know, when they see the statement online or on paper and they see their money adding up, that's exciting. Like yeah. that's really worth celebrating. Yeah. And the more you do that, the more it's going to grow in general. Yeah. Absolutely. It's uh, small things done consistently compound into big things over time. And uh, it's uh, such a fundamental lesson about wealth creation. uh, And it takes so little, but uh, it's so much of what um, shifting gears to girls with impact. 
um, you know, you're empowering um, women at an early age and uh, particularly in thinking about um, dreaming big and taking massive action and providing the community and the exposure to that. Um, how have you seen, uh, first of all, share a little bit about Girls with Impact and then let's dig into kind of what the impact is uh, in their future lives. Uh, well, we uh, run what we describe as a mini MBA or a business and leadership academy for young women. We are delivered live online. Um, mm -hmm. And we deliver it live online because these women can be in a class um, bringing an idea to life with somebody from Connecticut to India to California to Atlanta, like it's crazy. And when they come out of it after 10 weeks, they have a business plan, a venture pitch, and some version of a prototype of their business or nonprofit idea they come out of it with really a whole new sense of self. They, for the first mm. time, see themselves as a leader, their confidence goes through the roof. They now have resume material. They have work readiness skills from public speaking to tech to problem solving because they've been doing that through their own project. And that's what is so exciting about it. Um, so, so we've impacted about 10,000 young women. We have wow. millions more to do. And, um, you know, the caliber of our instructors are, um, very different from a, uh, you know, any other kind of after school or extracurricular program. These are people with MBAs and business experience. So they're in a small class um, at a set day and time for 10 weeks, and they're learning about all these business fundamentals. What might my idea be? Who's my customer? What's my value mm -hmm. proposition? How am I going to market it? How am I going to fund it? And then they come out of that with this jargon that they can use in uh, internship interviews, job interviews, scholarships. And we're seeing these young women getting double and triple full ride offers to college because of this program. It's huge, huge. So um, I think it's one of the biggest return on investments for a company or a philanthropist, you know, in changing the workplace and creating the talent that we need, the innovation. Uh, and folks, you know, folks like you, like more Nikki's. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, when you, start to believe in yourself at that young age, uh, the rest of your life, it, you know, you feel unstoppable because you have basically brought your idea to life and you start to believe in yourself and the shift in your identity makes everything else possible. And I've had the privilege of being at your events and witnessing firsthand just the incredible stories of these young women and the phenomenal ideas that they're pursuing that will have so much social impact. Um, what will help take your mission to the next level? If you had an ask, um, what, what is that that would take it to the next level? You know, to be really direct, it's like two things drive our success, funding and recruiting young women. So we're always looking for more young women to come into the program. They're 14 to 24. They go through the program at zero cost for a program that's like $1,000. Um, and we're always... You know, I started this with my own funds um, mm -hmm. and I don't take a salary, but, you know, I do want those leaders, philanthropists, companies who care about driving our economy, our talent for our companies to invest while these young women are young, because it's a game changer across the board. It's smart for America to try to train somebody when they're 14, 15, 16, 18, then at 45, like it's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what is it? It's like two thirds. It's, a, you know, a lot of women still see themselves not as a leader, adult women. Mm -hmm. And if we change that early and we give them tools and the mindset, I mean, as you said, it just, it, it changes their career trajectory and then therefore it can change their financial security, closing the wealth gap, the gender gap, all of that. But um, we got to be investing in these people mm -hmm. while they're young. You know, the smart companies, what they do is they are starting to recruit down to high school level because they understand mm -hmm. that if that that these students have heard our name, then when we go to hire, it's, they're going to, they're more likely to say yes. And yeah. so we want you know, we want companies who are either or philanthropists who are looking to either draw impact equity and opportunity for people who would otherwise be left out or want to build their talent base or want to um, engage their employees. Those are the things that we all do. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of focus, as you know, around diversity, but also the principles of ESG, the environment, um, social and governance things that mm. that are guiding how companies operate today. Like, are they are they thinking and caring about our planet? All these big topics, I think, really can trickle back down to this next generation because they care about the, these topics mm -hmm. big time over it's like 70% of them, one of, of Gen Z, wants to personally drive innovation. They mm -hmm. want to drive social change. They really want to do it in their, you know, in their jobs in some ways. A lot more women than ever want to be their own bosses, young women. And so how can we harness this mm -hmm. um, in a way that's, you know, creates a better world for us all? Yeah, that that's um, interesting. You know what you pointed out about uh, they want to be their own bosses, and there's definitely a move towards wanting you know sort of more of a gig economy and more freelance economy and just uh, entrepreneurial spirit. What? How do you see that impacting the large organizations that have a huge hiring need and an emerging talent pool that would prefer to be independent? Well, I think um, first off, they, you know, IBM CEO says he wants everybody to have an entrepreneurial mindset. So mm -hmm. I think first off, communicating those sorts of things that you've got to have purpose in in your mission as a company. I think underlying, but communicating that these young people mm -hmm. are, you know, they are looking at at companies before they make a hiring decision. And by the way. 70% of women said that they will not take a job unless they see women in senior roles. So mm -hmm. again, what companies can do, number one, is communicate that you embrace women, your young talent, and that, that there's a purpose behind the company. Um, the second thing is to harness um, them internally. And there's a couple of things. I mean, a lot of companies have innovation hubs internally. That can be mm -hmm. one way. But, you know, there's only so many people who are going to be in that part of a company, but there's other ways to engage the young people. I've seen reverse mentoring take place mm -hmm. where the young people might be uh, training older people on social media. This generation also wants to know that they are valued and they have a sense that they have something valuable to contribute. And so one of the things that can be very constructive is to include them on key meetings they don't mm -hmm. necessarily have to say something, but by the way, my, my view is they a lot of times have something very interesting and value added to, to say, but the people on the other side of the table might find it very interesting to hear from them and or to see them at, at the table. So I wouldn't shun them or keep them out just because they're they're new hires. You know, it's mm -hmm. a way for them to learn and, and, and all, all, all sorts of things. So those are just a couple examples. I think the last thing I know that I would mention that we're starting to do with companies is um, uh, young people definitely want to hone their uh, professional skills. And, and they shared this in our own report. They're public speaking, for example, launching a product is the other example. Mm -hmm. And so if companies, if um, employees within a company, for example, those employees, they can be very young, become mentors to our young women uh, which mm -hmm. they can once they finish our academy, that can be a way for them to hone their management and leadership skills just by being a mentor, right? We've got that mm -hmm. that um, programming already built out so they don't have to think through what am I going to talk to, you know, Julia, Julia about um, it's built out, but definitely a way for them to give back, feel a sense of purpose on the job, transferring their own skills and honing their leadership skills mm -hmm. at the same time. So lots of different ways for organizations to collaborate with Girls With Impact to not only uh, you know, uh, leverage the, the in, enormous talent pool available, but also to pay it forward and to contribute to the mission that way and uh, really build ties for the future. You know, a couple of really good examples, Nikki, I think is um, Johnson & Johnson's been a, a large partner and they engage their employees. They've first brought our program seats to their employees and their network. Mm. And the feedback was unbelievable. And, and it was rolled out very successfully where it was teased or mentioned in a global town hall, working with some of their employee networks, specifically the Latino network. 
And then we did a briefing with employees, but the, the chat from these employees was like, oh my gosh, they're putting their money where their mouth is. Mm -hmm. And then we, we've continued and now the employees are tapping into their community networks to help us recruit young women. And it's mm. just so great all the way around, right? Um, yeah. It's just so great. So that's a really good example. Um, and we've partnered with them on, on so many different levels. The, the other one, and we work with companies large and small, but another sort of interesting one is uh, Shea Moisture, which is owned by Unilever and the largest black hair care products. You know, we've partnered with them to specifically serve women of color um, up to age 25 or so with our program because they very much have this entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. We provide the structure with our programming. And again, just them tapping into their whole community to let them know about this. And it builds goodwill behind the brand, of course, mm -hmm. right? We showcase these women and their ventures. Um, we're doing venture competitions now regularly and we'll be showcasing them um, as sort of the, you know, 20 under 20 best of the next generation women wow. leaders. Very exciting. Oh, that sounds fantastic. I'm excited to hopefully get to see some of those. Um, I'm curious about your perspective on a somewhat controversial topic lately, which is about the return to work, uh, return to the office. Uh, a lot of prominent CEOs have uh, mandated a five days a week back to the office um, expectation for their employees. Um, on the other hand, there's pushback from women in particular that are seeking more flexibility um, and uh, are struggling with the expectation of 100% return. Um, I love your thoughts on two fronts. One, your perspective on the topic in general. And second, what are you hearing from the Gen Z community that uh, you know, you support? Yeah, well, I think there is definitely a powerful advantage to having people together. I think about it all the time. We have always been a virtual company. We bring people together. I've toyed with the idea of, you know, should we all go back in the office regularly? But the reason it works successfully for us, and then I'll come back to the larger picture, picture is everybody comes together every day. And everybody is held accountable and they, you know, we have something that we call a tracker where ev whatever everybody is doing for that week is there and check the box. And, um, and, and we also have people who are really committed and hard workers. Um, I think there are some jobs where, you know, flexibility makes sense, um, but you still have to deliver for the company. They're paying money to have you, right? Mm. Understandably. And for other jobs, you know, I understand why people need to be together. They're, they're, they're collaborating, they're strategizing. Um, there is some advantage. And, you know, we, we talk about this all the time of, of doing that in a face-to-face -face context, certainly meeting with clients, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, what I feel like most companies are doing are they're skipping the Fridays or maybe doing a three day a week. But, or, and other companies are saying it's up to the business head because that, that business head, you know, they're accountable and they have to make their, that mm -hmm. business unit function. And you've got to kind of understand that. Right. Mm -hmm. So then I think, you know, there, uh, you know, if I were running a different kind of company, I'd be thinking about, okay, well, what kinds of roles do work where there's flexibility to work for, from home? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we all have to deliver however we're doing it. So, um, but, but with, with, with regard to Gen Z, you know, we definitely only have people who they will not look for a job unless it's online flexible only, you know, they mm. just will not, um, you know, on the flip side, I've also heard some look at with the whole COVID impact, you know, the, the in-person it's, you know, there's some advantage to that. And so we bring our people together once a month, we mm -hmm. come together um, digitally, just like this every day. And I think mm -hmm. that is really important because people need to feel connectivity. I feel like that's yeah. important. Um, but, you know, these companies have to do what they think is going to equal success for them. I mean, that's, you know, that's what's yeah. really driving their decision. It's not, yeah. we don't want women, we don't want whatever. It's what do they need to do to function? And it is, it's based on the kind of business that they're in. 
Right. Yeah, it's uh, um, every industry is different. For example, you can be in manufacturing as if everyone is working from home. Um, certain types of industries and roles uh, lend themselves much better to flexibility. I think with an emerging uh, talent pool, um, we often talk about the loss of apprenticeship culture and the need for programs like yours that offer that structured guidance and mentorship and skill development in a cohort-based environment that allows them to uh, learn and grow and also get the support and accountability that's necessary. You know, we just had a, a very large company is interested in us um, bringing our program to their younger women sort of for that very reason, because they're working digitally. They have no, they don't have the same environment to be honing their leadership skills, whatever. And, you know, the company wants it and the young women want it, right? So how do you, how do you do that? Um, <laughs> the world has definitely changed though. It's not easy. Um, you know, I, I look at my husband's gone back to work almost four days a week and he likes it. You know, he's in the financial industry. I think, you know, one, one um, positive to it is it takes you out of the home so that when you're home, it can be more your, you know, your, your serene, you know, mm -hmm. place of relief. Right. And so I think if you do work from home, you know, I think you need a really good setup. I've seen people in closets a lot over <laughs> years, like literally, yeah. and that is no way to work. Right. So yeah. I think you really have to set up a, what feels like a real office mm -hmm. environment and you yeah. go to work there and you leave it when you're done and that's it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I personally found that, uh, punctuation became so important because it's easy when you're working from home for your life and work to blend in so much that there's no beginning and there's no end and that can be dangerous over time where it becomes stressful and eventually leads to burnout because you don't have natural boundaries like a commute to work that punctuates your uh, work day yeah definitely yeah. Uh, well, let's uh, dive into our lightning round questions. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask you five questions and uh, would uh, love to learn more about you through these. Uh, number one, what book has greatly influenced you? You know, I love um, Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. I had, um, you know, a very interesting business leader years ago when I was in college, give me that book. And um, with a message about, you know, reaching, reaching high. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's one of those books that, you know, when you're facing something in life, you go back to it because the different chapters are on different uh, events in life that can be a real, um, you know, twist or turn for you, whether it's um, marriage or a death or love. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I really love that. It's got a spiritual element to it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I certainly turn to that. Um, from time to time. And it's it's just one of those books I love to keep on, on my nightstand. Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, what is your favorite inspiring quote or saying? Well, I'm a big believer that if there's a will, there's a way, Nikki. Mm. I just, I live by that so much. If someone says no, I figure out like, well, maybe there's another way. And if the door's really shut, then I'm now at this age where I think that, um, that's not quite the right path. And I have to give it time because as I like to say, the answer will reveal itself. So that's another really good one is that when you are feeling anxious, why, or what's the decision I'm supposed to make or which way would the answer will reveal itself. There will be hmm. something, some piece of information that you'll get somewhere from the universe, from somebody that will go, oh yeah, no, that that's not right. Oh, uh, completely align with that. <laughs> What is one word or moniker that you would use to describe yourself? Somebody asked me once, like, what kind of car I would say. And I think I said, like, a little, ah. well, I'm a really big thinker, but the, the word and phrase that comes to mind that I also encourage people to think about is what is a leapfrog move that you can make to go further. And that leapfrog move can be, you know, can be with your company, your business. It could be the role that you're in, in your organization. Like, how do I, I have this goal. 
How do I get to where, like really where I want to go? And really focusing on the big things. I, I took mm. this job when I was uh, earlier in my career in the financial industry, and I decided that I was going to focus on two or three signature moves. I'm going to do my job, okay? But it's so easy, I think, sometimes for people to let like minutia and all these little things get in the way. You have to be doing that. That's just life, and we all do minutia. But what are the moves that can really like change the game for your company, your business, your own professional happiness? Maybe you feel like you want to go another stage level. What's that one leapfrog move mm, that will help that. you get there? Okay, on that, uh, what is a change or a habit that you implemented that made your life better? I am a huge believer in being grateful every day. We mm -hmm. live in, you know, despite tremendous things going on in this world right now, you know, we have food, mm -hmm. we have a roof over our head. Um, I am grateful like every day I give thanks. I mean, I, and I, I know that it can change in a nanosecond for any of us and, I think we should be so grateful we're not living in another part of the world. And I know there are people listening on other parts yeah. of the world. Um, but if you're listening to this, we should be grateful. Yeah. We're all fortunate to be alive. And, we're all fortunate uh, to be alive, you know? And yes. Yeah. Grat uh, it's more gratitude uh, and fewer expectations. And I try to, I guess, to add to that, I try to really communicate that better than I used to. I'm somebody who, um, you know, I move very quickly. I don't, I'm not as verbose in my emails and sometimes talking to people. And I really have integrated that. Like, you know, I really appreciate what you did, really giving, like, thanking. Mm -hmm acknowledging people, showing your appreciation, it goes a long way and looking people in the eye and saying that, and it, it, yeah. all of that will come back to you. Yeah. It's powerful. All right. And our final question is what power song would you want playing as you walk out onto a stage? Well, I have played this song many times giving <laughs> speeches and particularly financial speeches, and that is ain't no mountain high enough. Ah. <laughs> um, right. So there is ain't no mountain high enough. Um, you can climb it. Um, as, as someone said, you know, it might not be a straight line. It will not be a straight line today um, because the world has changed. But, you know, I think we all really can. I, I think if we really temper our expectations, too, so that we don't say that we have to be, have X, Y, and Z in order to be happy. Like we really have the basics, but if mm -hmm. you want to achieve certain things, I mean, you really can. And, and I guess the last word related I would leave with folks is to, again, as I said, and this was based on some national research I did on, on my book, The Millionaire Zone, is that the answer is often right in front of your face, staring at you. If you want to, again, whether it's professional success, personal success, those who are successful in life, financially successful, millionaires, not including their home, they more than non-millionaires leverage the people and organizations right around them to get to where they want to go. Mm. And so think about that. Rather than taking a leap way out here into the unknown, think about can you in your certain situation, your current job situation, shift, make, make a shift that gets you closer to that mountaintop. Wherever you are, everything is possible. You bet. And thank you <laughs> so much for having me. And, and, you know, kudos to all the great work that you do. And I'm, I'm so grateful to be a part of your show and, and all that you're doing at Beyond Barriers. Thank you for being on the show. And I'm excited for our audience, wherever they are, to uh, read your book, to uh, connect with Girls With Impact. And, uh, you know, if you're a young woman looking for opportunity, this is the place uh, to learn powerful life skills and for organizations to support your mission. Um, so thank you so much for sharing all that you have accomplished, the strategies that work for you, and also the massive mission that you're on. Uh, our best wishes are with you. Thank you so much.